I find that um, for some reason now, every time I want to record a video, just before I press record, my mouth just goes really dry. It's like my brain goes, nope, you're not recording for 20 minutes, no chance. It's really annoying. Anyway, welcome back to my office, everybody. I haven't been here for about six weeks. I've, uh, I've been traveling and stuff, which has been lots of fun, but I'm very pleased to be back. That said, this video I did intend to uh, film while I was away a few days ago in Greenland, but it didn't go to plan, as many of you will, I imagine, have expected. So uh, one of the reasons that I was in Greenland was to do a workshop for some of the kids who are from there, which is really, really fun. And I don't do too many workshops, but I think I'm going to start kind of considering how I could do more because I, I do quite enjoy them. But anyway, what I've learned when I do do workshops, do do workshops? What I've learned when I do do workshops is that I get all these kind of tips and pieces of advice that I've been given over the years. They all kind of just flood straight back to me. And some of them are really good and really useful. And I try and pass those pieces of advice on, obviously. And uh, others are completely useless and just really bad advice and I try not to pass those on but I thought I'd do a video about those bad pieces of advice in the hope that they can uh, well maybe make you think or maybe make you avoid them or you might disagree with them which would be interesting in itself so yeah I thought I'd just do a quick video about about the worst people I genuinely can't talk also this video is sponsored by Lumix and I've noticed that still when I go to places like Greenland or places anywhere really with quite harsh conditions that I get other photographers coming up to me and saying, whoa man, you're, you're bringing a mirrorless camera here. And it's as though there is still like a, a subsection of the photography community who think that mirrorless cameras are the same as they were like 10 and 15 years ago, which is just not the case. I mean, 10 and 15 years ago, yeah, you wouldn't have taken a mirrorless camera to Greenland because if you'd have dropped it in the ice or left it in a blizzard, it probably wouldn't have fared all that well. Whereas now, I mean, this G9 is built like a tank. It's absolutely brilliant. I've taken this all over the world and have never had any problems with it. So yeah, mirrorless cameras have come on leaps and bounds in, uh, in durability, if you, if you weren't aware of that. So uh, yeah, interesting point, I think. Now, bad tip number one, probably the worst tip I've ever been given by actually quite a respected photographer. I'm not gonna mention his name because it was a really bad piece of advice. And outside of that, I think he's really good. But I was once told to always shoot wide open. And perhaps he was giving me that advice because at that stage I was kind of just a beginner. And uh, when you're a beginner, one of the most aesthetically pleasing things is to see sort of out of focus elements of an image. And you can kind of achieve a, a professional look by shooting wide open, even if you suck at photography, because we always associated shallow depth of field with good cameras and generally good photographers because of that. Uh, trouble is now that with portrait mode on phones, maybe that's kind of died down a bit, but also lenses very rarely perform optically, 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 can't talk, optically at their best. Uh, when they're wide open. So a lot of the best ones will be still really, really sharp in the center, although maybe not quite as sharp as they would be stopped down by a stop or two. Uh, but if you have a subject that's not right in the middle of the frame, you might find that your image is a little bit soft. You might also notice vignetting, which in some cases is desirable, but not always. And the other problem you might find is that if you miss focus, even just slightly, your image will be ruined. So if you're taking a portrait and you wanna focus on the eyes, but accidentally you focus on the nose, well then the image is just useless. Whereas if you'd stop down a couple of stops, it probably wouldn't be the end of the world because you might have got the eyes in focus too. So yeah, there's a time and a place to open a lens right up. If you're in really low light and you've reached like the, the maximum ISO that you're willing to put your camera to, then uh, yeah, you'll need to shoot wide open. But certainly for depth of field, um, stopping down by just a little bit can really, really help improve the optical performance of most lenses. And uh, that's something I'd really recommend. Certainly at the start when you're, um, when you're just learning. Terrible tip number two is to pick a style. Now it's commonly known that in photography, all the most successful photographers really have a kind of a subject or a kind of subject, a genre that they shoot. But what I despise about this piece of advice is the word pick. 
like you can just kind of pluck something out of the air, you know, oh, I'll shoot street photography, or oh, I'll, I'll shoot landscape photography. And I've noticed that in some instances, you get really quite experienced photographers who will refuse to kind of go out and experiment with another kind of photography, because all know I'm known for this kind of photography. It's not easy to find a genre that you want to shoot and that you want to dedicate loads and loads of your time to, and it shouldn't be a decision that's rushed or just picked. It should be a decision that you come to over the course of years of experimentation. And to suggest that it can just be sort of picked, I think is um, is detrimental to the experience of learning your, your craft, I would suggest. And I mean, me for example, it took me a long, long time to work out that I wanted to take photos in places where I wanted to spend my time. That's basically what I would define my, my style or my genre as. It's not really a style or a genre, but I do not care. And the point is that I've experimented a lot. I visited lots of places that I didn't particularly want to be just for photos, and I didn't enjoy it. So I've got to a point where now I know what I want to shoot and why I want to shoot it. That wouldn't have happened without lots of experimentation, and I certainly couldn't have just gone down a list of genres and just picked one, which I think was uh, what was implied when I was told that bit of advice. Useless tip number three is to always use a tripod. Now I've picked up some heat for my opinions on tripods before. I hate tripods if you don't know. If you're new to this channel, you might not know that I, I do everything I can to avoid using tripods. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that, just as I don't think there's anything wrong with using tripods. The point is that it's a personal preference. If you find that you enjoy shooting more with a tripod, if you find that you're more productive, if you find that you get better images with a tripod, great, keep using a tripod. But you don't have to. It's personal choice. It's not absolutely factual that you'll get better photos when you use one, apart from when you're shooting in the dark or with crazy filters. The fact is, is that if you've got a modern camera that has some form of stabilization and you have good technique and you're shooting above sort of one or two hundredths of a second with your shutter speed on, on kind of relatively normal focal lengths, uh, you will get good shots. You will get sharp shots. Shots that wouldn't be any sharper if you used a tripod. So um, yeah. There's really no need if, if you're working in, in that set of parameters. That said, if you like using a tripod, go for it. It's just that you don't have to, I don't think. And uh, some people go to great lengths to tell you that you, you do, which I think is silly. Rubbish tip number four is that you need to use filters. Uh, now, I rarely use filters, to be honest. I find it much easier to uh, darken a sky, for example, in Lightroom with just one click of a button. I find that much simpler than messing around in the field with uh, loads of filters, like graduated filters and stuff, when it could be raining, the weather could be bad, just bleh, I'd much prefer to do it in post and not risk missing images out in the field because I'm faffing around with, with filters. That said, if you're shooting kind of water or something and you want to blur water, you will need a filter. And likewise, if you want to remove glare from a scene, then you'll probably need a polarizer too. But outside of that, you really don't need filters. It's so easy to make uh, adjustments to images with capable files and modern cameras in post-production. You don't need to do it in camera. Again, it may well be a personal preference that you do it in camera, in which case that's absolutely fine, but you don't have to. That's my point. And uh, all of these things I've been told, basically, I, I kind of have to do to get good photos in the past, and it's, it's rubbish. Number five, buy the best SD cards. No, useless, rubbish. Um, I mean, I have good cards. I've got uh, SanDisk Extreme cards, which have got very fast write speeds, but do I need them? The majority of the time, no, I don't need them. I've got these in case I wanna film things in 4K, which I do every so often. And if I didn't do that, I could get by with completely bog standard cards, because I very rarely shoot things like sports, and I very rarely hit the buffer on my camera. So uh, write speeds generally aren't all that important to me, so I could get by with um, with normal cards. And if you're on a budget with your photography, which all of us are pretty much, then uh, I think your money would be better spent on other things than the best SD cards, personally. Number six, I think. I always lose my place on these list videos, but never mind. Uh, number six is that you have to nail your focal length. Now I see a lot of 
people uh, when I do do kind of workshop things and they'll they'll agonize over whether they've got the exact right focal length and the exact composition that they're aiming for in camera. And uh, I would suggest that you don't do that. I'd suggest that you get roughly the composition you're after and then go a little bit wider than that to allow for cropping and changes in aspect ratio in post and then shoot and then go and find another composition, go and find something else to take a photo of. Because more often than not, when I've done that in the past, when I've uh, tried to make sure that I've got absolutely the exact composition that I want, more often than not, I get home and find that I want to change it and I want to crop or I wish I'd gone wider or I wish I'd not taken as much time and I'd gone and got another two or three photos down the track. So yeah, obviously composition is vital and I'm not saying don't pay attention to that, but there's such a thing as paying too much attention to it and worrying that you haven't got the exact right frame when actually, chances are more often than not, you want to give yourself room to crop in post. Number seven is golden hour or bust. Now this is a big one for me because lots of people I've noticed advocate only really shooting at the, uh, the best times of day for light. So golden hour, blue hour, things like that. And don't get me wrong, I love to shoot at golden hour and I love to shoot at blue hour, but they are not the only times of day that you can get really good photos. Orange light is just one kind of story, but the fact is stories happen 24 hours a day and stories are what photography is all about. So there's always things to take photos of regardless of whether you have orange skies or not. And uh, thinking otherwise, I think, means that you, you're missing out on some great opportunities for photos and storytelling. Number eight or nine, I think. This one's probably gonna be a bit controversial as well. You always need to shoot raw is a quote that I think is, is nonsense. Now, if you're shooting a scene that's very high in contrast or a scene that you think is gonna need extensive editing, then clearly it makes sense to capture all the detail you can and to shoot in RAW. However, there are times when shooting in JPEG is absolutely fine. In fact, I think there's a whole generation of photographers who have kind of just shot RAW for so long, and this is me included, that they haven't noticed that JPEG processes in modern cameras have become really, really incredible and impressive. And a lot of the time, it would be absolutely fine to just get the JPEGs. So yeah, if you've got card space, if you've got storage space, if your computer's got the processing power, if you can be bothered to go through the hassle, the extra added hassle of shooting RAWs all the time, then go for it. But if you're shooting particularly like fast moving action on shots that you don't think you're gonna be editing all that much, then I kind of think, well, Give JPEGs a shot. And to be honest, you might be surprised at how good they come out. And number nine, I think this one is, because it's the last one on my list and I, I think the list is nine things. Image quality is all about sensors. No. So clearly a sensor is the major uh, impact on things like ISO and sharpness and dynamic range and all that kind of stuff. The thing is though, making a, a good image or a great image that is also about things like timing and preparation and skill. And too often, I think the term image quality is, uh, is used to only describe what a sensor is capable of. You know, if you look for the term image quality on Google, then chances are you'll come up with a, a load of reviews that have all kinds of charts and stuff showing supposedly what image quality is. The fact is that you need to find a sensor that fits into a camera body that ergonomically works for you and fits into your bag and your workflow. Then you need to do a whole load of preparation and a whole load of learning in order to match that sensor and those ergonomics to a scene that's gonna be a good photo. And that is just completely lost on uh, what seems to have become the, the concept of image quality. And I think it forces people to overlook or, or place too much importance on sensors and not enough importance of other aspects of a camera and also other aspects of uh, the, the art of photography, basically. I think too often people focus too much on, uh, on specs and graphs and all the stuff that can make a difference to photos, but probably nowhere near as big a difference as, uh, as I say, things like timing. So yeah, that was a, a terrible tip. I mean, most of these are, are quite obvious to me and some of them are, are more debatable than others, but to me, these are, are probably the, the worst pieces of photography advice I've been given in the years that I've, I've been shooting. Hopefully you found some of that useful. Hopefully you agreed with some of it. If you disagreed with some of it as well, I'd love to hear what you think and uh, I'll be back soon. Still here, I'm gonna be here for a few weeks, which is nice because when you're at home, you, uh, well, you don't run out of pants. Oh, 
also, the book, those of you who have ordered the book, uh, it's on its way to me, or they are on their way to me, and I can't wait to, uh, to take delivery of them. I've changed the front cover, improved I think, to uh, a bit more of an interesting image, and uh, I'm looking forward to sending those out. So if you've bought one, thank you so much, it'll be with you soon. Uh, there's a few days of pre-order left, but after that I won't be signing any more, I'll just be sending them, because well, it's turned out that I'm going to be spending a lot of time signing books, which is fine, but if it gets any more then it will mean that I do less videos, which is which is too sad. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for your orders, can't wait to send them to you, they'll be with you soon. Thanks for watching.